Hi, everybody. Before we get to another great interview, please do me a favor. Go to our YouTube channel, MeisterCon Pod, or any of your favorite audio applications. Subscribe. We could really use the help. Thank you so, so much. And I hope you enjoy another terrific interview. See you soon. <laughs> been, doing, been doing this for a while. Hi, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Two Opinionated. I'm so excited today. I almost screwed up the intro. <laughs> I've got actress Mary Chifo with me. So welcome, Mary. Thank you. <laughs> I was going to say, I've, I've been doing this for a few years. You think I would know where the record button is, but then my oh. dumb ass hit the record button in the middle of me saying that. So now I was like, <laughs> there you go. Oh, hi. How's it going? Yeah. And now we have the whole, like, you're now being recorded. Please yeah. be aware of the fact that you are being recorded. That's right. You know, and they added that in, mm -hmm. like, like Zoom was out for a long time before they yeah. added that in and they didn't warn anybody. Yes. So the first time that happened, it just, every, everything just stopped. You know, I just yes. froze up. So I totally, yes. I don't remember who I was interviewing, but I totally messed up that. that <laughs> <is>. <laughs> so good. She feels like a friend now, whoever. Now, yeah, now we're friendly. We get along. You're, you're, you're now recording, lady. <laughs> yeah. I get, you know, somebody was getting recorded and didn't know it. Yes. Well, yeah, that's, you know, like with any rule, it's like it, it came to be because, Somebody did something. <laughs> Somebody did something wrong. <laughs> well, welcome, Mary. I'm so excited to to talk with you. This is a this. I'm glad we're near the end of the week because this this is a great way for me to finish my interviews for the week. Oh, great. Well, thank you. Yeah, I've been looking forward to this as well. <laughs> so I, I, we have to talk discovery, but before we do that, you know, let's talk a little bit about how you got into acting. What made you want to be an entertainer? Um, the, 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 I always try and have like the, the shortest version of my origin story. Cause there's like, you know, the 10, 10 chapter version as well. Uh, but I do like, um, telling the side of both of my parents are working character actors. And so I grew up in LA around just performers in general and kind of, it was very normalized for me, but the, the, the funny anecdote is that I really thought everyone was an actor up until about fourth grade <laughs> because um, when my parents would be auditioning for, you know, a doctor or a lawyer or, you know, teacher, anything in between, um, they, you know, get dressed up for their audition or whatever and say, hey, do you think I look like a doctor? And I'm like, yeah, you do. Good job. <laughs> or like, or I'd see them, you know, playing one of those characters on TV and be like, oh, that's what you did. But then when you come home, you're mom or dad and you just are kind of this person. And yep. uh, then it, I, I remember at some point in fourth grade, I had a friend in my class who was talking about their parent actually being a lawyer or a doctor or something like that. <laughs> and I kind of was like, and then, and then they go home and then they, or they act, or like, I just kind of alluded to it in this way <laughs> that they were like, no, they actually have this profession. And it just kind of clicked yeah. for me that, um, people actually studied to be these professions and worked very hard <laughs> to be these things. And, and, you know, which also as an actor, you obviously, as I came to know, you work very hard to pretend exactly to be. Exactly right. <laughs> but um, that's kind of the, the shift moment of me realizing also, because at the time I was very into sci-fi and fantasy yeah. and, you know, really into certain movies and books. And my best friend, Eve and I, who's still one of my best friends, we had started like making little movies on her camcorder and, um, and you know, we were, had, you know, had a lot of imaginary games and stuff. Um, and then just were like, oh, well, what if we filmed them? And um, she still has all the tapes and one day we're going to go through all of it and just, you know, well, you have bask to. In the glory. That's, yeah. YouTube, that's YouTube channel material right there. Uh, seriously. I know there's sometimes I think about what if we were like, cause we're, we're, you know, still in LA, there's still certain locations where we filmed where, yeah. what if we did something where we like replicated the thing we did as kids or something? You I don't should. know. should. Yeah, we really should. And especially cause we are still close and we're both still acting and all that. But that was like the shift was in addition to playing imaginary games, we then started filming them. And then I uh, ended up auditioning for um, Millican Middle School, which is a magnet performing arts school, yeah. still here in LA. Um, and uh, 
funnily enough, through soccer, one of my soccer teammates was there and said, oh, they've got a great program. And um, I was looking at changing schools and I had really won. I went to a Waldorf school. That's where I was, which was, uh, you know, very, um, you know, alternative education in a lot of ways, woodworking, <laughs> knitting, a oh, lot of imaginary work, a lot of, you know, our main lessons every year focused on different mythologies and religions. So it was kind of all encompassing, which I'm really grateful oh. for because it not only enforced my sense of storytelling, but also I think allowed me to be a very like open-minded accepting person. Cause I, I was like, oh, everyone has different ways of being in the world and believing different things. And that's great. Um, and obviously really, you know, as I'm creating my own imaginary games, I'm thinking about the Greek myths that I was hearing about. Right. So then I ended up getting into Millikan, getting into the musical theater program. And that's when I became like a full-fledged theater kid. Um, and just, I saw Wicked when I was in seventh grade and that was a game changer because <laughs> Elphaba really was the first time I really felt I saw myself on stage. Yeah. Um, and that was so exciting. And uh, I found a really great group of theater kids at my school, like, you know, our, our own little cluster within the larger yeah, You gotta have a little click. Yeah, exactly. And, um, and then I ended up in high school uh, at Campbell Hall having a really excellent drama teacher, Josh Adell, who had studied Strasbourg at NYU and kind of created, you know, I don't even wanna say like a watered down version of what he had learned. He, if anything, what was beautiful was that he just created the high school version where it was, you know, within, you know, the semester long high school time, he just, you know, we did relaxation technique, all the sorts of stuff. He loved finding obscure plays for our, we had a play in a musical every year and uh, ensemble driven. Uh, we read, you know, various plays in, in class as well. And I feel like that was Sounds like a I, fun class. Oh, just excellent. And I was so lucky too, both in middle school and high school, the year I was in, happened to be just one of those years where there was a lot of really um great theater kids you know like you know there's never a bad year but I just felt like <laughs> we all really vibed and really a lot of us really wanted to perform and um so I was very lucky there and um you know high schools when <laughs> for whatever reason our society has decided we have to decide what we want to do with our lives right um but I really did find that um I always said that acting kept being the thing I was willing to suffer the most for, <laughs> even though, you know, I was very <laughs> studious, very academically inclined. I loved art history. I did soccer. I ended up um, stopping soccer. I broke my ankle and then tried to kind of get back into it in middle yeah. school. And it just, it was kind of one of those, I think, universe guiding me in a different direction things. Um, <laughs> but I still did dance and, you know, a lot of performing stuff, but yeah. acting was kind of the core of what I loved the most. And then starting looking at colleges and my dad actually had gone to Juilliard for drama right. and uh, was in group six. And uh, we were in New York visiting because both my parents kind of came of age in New York. Um, and uh, so that was a place that we would, my dad's from Long Island, we would visit there. My dad was like, hey, you wanna go and like tour Juilliard? That's where I went. And I didn't really have much of a idea of what Juilliard was because I think my dad had gone there. Like it didn't have, I think, I think a certain didn't sort have of the mystique. Yeah. The mystique in the same way that uh, other people might've had. And I'm like, yeah, sure. You know, I mean, I'm starting to look at colleges, but at the time I wasn't sure if I wanted to do liberal arts and do theater. And, you know, I just was still figuring it out. Um, but then when I toured the school, it was one of those moments where I, it's scary to have that feeling where like, I'm, I'm supposed to be here. You know, I really was like, this is where I'm destined to be. Yeah. Luckily, I guess there was something in me that knew uh, because I did end up, that was my number one choice. And I worked really hard on that audition in addition to a few other conservatories, but that really did seeing how that program worked inspired me to look at other conservatories. Cause I realized that rigor was the rigor I loved. And I did have that with my academics as well, but it just was a turning point. It made me because that was around like mid 10th grade. So for the rest of my time in high school, I really started going, oh yeah, I can take that rigor that I have in my English class or my art history class um, and put that just into honing my craft as an actor. And that's what really excites me. Um, so that's what led me to really focusing in on that. But the way they have the audition process at Juilliard is you have your first two monologues, a contemporary classical, you have backups. 
and then they might ask you to sing, but they're not looking at your material, like any resume, any anything until you have that initial audition moment. So I'm going like, I promise you, I'm a hard worker. I'm a great, you know, like all these things. <laughs> you kind of have to come in and say like, here, you know, here, here I here's am. The talent. <laughs> yeah, and luckily there was, there was enough going on. I do think my contemporary monologue is one that is, a, I, I was lucky I found it. And thankfully because of my high school drama teacher, this play called Well by Lisa Crone, who went on yeah. to do the book for uh, Fun Home um, and won the Tony for that. Um, but there's this monologue in that play that is just easily one I could have told about my own childhood. And I think, you know, they saw that I was willing to go to a place that was both vulnerable and funny <laughs> uh, about basically dressing up as little match girl and everyone else dressing up as a princess for Halloween and feeling like I was trying to be creative and authentic and everyone else gets to look pretty. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, that, that kind of, I think, turn the scales in my favor. And then luckily I, they did get to see then, oh, she's really driven and passionate. And um, they have such an elaborate uh, audition process now because they got rid of the cut system. It used to be, they would admit a few, like a fair amount more of students per year and then cut midway through the program. And now it's Brutal. just, yeah, yeah. It's like not that <laughs> Jim Houghton, um, who sadly passed away since then, and it was just such an incredible beacon of light um, and it created the signature theater. He, when he came in as Ted, that was like the first thing he got rid of. He was like, there's enough stress. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's brutal. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like, let's just let them focus on bonding with each other amidst all the other crazy stress. So um, I was very lucky that that was, you know, and I think for my dad too, you know, he was there right when it was the most intense. Um, and uh, I think he was very happy to see how much the program had shifted towards really fostering within a rigorous program that it was about community and being able to communicate, but um, didn't mean that the the work ultimately in scene study or whatever, you're still still gonna be hard and challenging. Um, but that, you know, and then I got to be in New York for four years, uh, which was really helpful in just owning my own craft um, with my, you know, I, I have such a respect for both of my parents' work and art and the life that they've built as a consequence of their acting. Um, but I think it was important for me to kind of own that on my own. Um, yeah, and you wanna stand on your own two feet. Yeah. yeah. And so now I feel like, you know, I, every time I came back, even when I was studying and now it's been however many years since I graduated, I just have much more of a um, confidence in, you know, what I've learned and how my technique works because everyone's technique is different. Um, but yeah, so that's, so, that's so, my, I told you I was going to give you the short that, version. That's a that's really good funny. story though. So, so okay. does it, I'm assuming that it doesn't help you at all that you had a family member that graduated from there. They probably don't care about that. No, no, yeah, that, that, I mean, at least that initial screening is really like, what is the energy of this person? How is, you know, and it's, it's, you know, it's more than just, you know, what is talent, it's energy. And I think, you know, they're looking for students who they can help foster and shape. So they're not looking yeah. for perfect students, but I think, yeah, they're looking for eager, excited people. And then of course, you know, um, yeah, but there are plenty, plenty of alum. My dad and I are actually the first legacy at the school uh, for nice. drama. So wow. and there had been people in the past. That's a big um, deal. Yeah, and it sounds yeah. so epic too. <laughs> it does. Well, did I you have to? It. Did you have to sing during your your initial? I did. Yeah, I was really excited because I do love singing. That's kind of always been something that has driven me. I mean, I since you know, I actually in kindergarten got chased around the playground because I wouldn't stop singing there. The, the, like the, the rest of the kids like decided one day that um, they were going to corner me and say, stop singing. Um, but uh, all is well, apparently it didn't deter me enough. I was surrounded by enough people that said, keep singing, Mary. Um, but I always like, cra like, you've got a crazy range, right? That's what I'd heard. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, yeah, on, on my best days, but yes, I um, luckily, you know, and, and through working on it, I, I think in a lot of ways I can live in a more alto mezzo place, but then I, I discovered in high school, actually my senior musical, we did the boyfriend and I played Madame Dubonnet, uh, who has a very legit <laughs> higher range and, um, really fun part. 
And uh, I just discovered that actually there was an authenticity to that style of singing, the more of like a mix head, legit sound that I was like, oh, maybe that's even more my voice. Cause of course I was obsessed with Wicked and I wanted to belt like Elphaba and I can't do that, but I think I live more in the legit place. And when I now kind of am playing around, I usually am in that realm, but I just have always, I do really vocally, whether it be singing or just dialect. And I'm sure as we'll get into talking about Trek. I mean, that was just the ideal thing. I just love playing with my voice. And um, I've been so grateful that I've, you know, through my training had been given, I've been given so many tools to refine it. And all of the voice and speech work I did, we did have singing at Juilliard as well, but just in addition, just the voice and speech, um, you know, articulation and learning where to breathe and all that sort of stuff has just, you know, strengthened more and more um, my ability to sing. And uh, it's funny, I was just actually talking about that earlier today, just getting back to, you know, having a consistent warm up and uh, singing a bit more, but I've had a oh, lot of fun. I was going to ask you that is, do you have a trick to kind of maintain your voice? I mean, do you have a, a something that you drink or is it just a warm up session? You know, how do you kind of keep your uh, voice in shape? Yeah, well, I will say throat coat is, I swear by it. It's the best. I get to get like, I, yeah, anytime I have yeah. to do either like, um, I would, you know, drink it when I was working on set when lately when I've been doing Star Trek online, like anytime I have a session for that, or um, if I'm singing, um, always throat coat. And then I did, um, part of the Juilliard program is you really do kind of by third and fourth year, create your own warm up. Um, they give you, they throw a lot of different techniques at you. That's kind of a big part of the program is like, there's so many different ways to hone your instrument. Here's like all of them. And like, now figure out which one really, you know, ignites you. And then often I think it's for which role, because, you know, depending on the demands of a character, you're going to want to warm up differently. Um, but I do have a kind of baseline 10 to 15 minute. I mean, anywhere, I guess I have 10 to 30 minutes, depending on how much time I have, but kind of starting on the floor, both physical and vocal warm up that if I am going to be doing like a long voiceover session or on the days, even when I had to get up at two in the morning to get ready for a Trek day. Um, I would, you know, I really knew I needed that warm up separately from getting to set because those are long, long days, but I prefer to be, you know, in my body. Cause once you're you in the be ready. Of armor, yeah, you can't, you know, you can't stretch in the same way. When right. you're covered. <laughs> um, but yeah, starting on the floor incorporating a lot of Alexander technique and then um, different voice and speech kind of just like moving through consonants and vowels um, yeah. a lot of, um, just opening of the chest and then a little bit of yoga. Cause I got actually kind of to supplement what I was doing at Juilliard. Um, I got really into yoga, uh, around my second year. Um, and it kind of just gave me another vocabulary that helped me in my physical classes in school. Um, which was, which was really great. So it's kind of a fusion of all of that. Uh, that kind of, yeah, starting on the floor, kind of moving upward, rolling up. Maybe and then, that's what I'm missing for the podcast. I need a vocal warm up for podcast. Yeah. We get, you get, you get all sorts of, you do some tongue twisters. Oh, I would do them poorly. Yeah. <laughs> I get tongue tied so easily. That's probably, honestly, that's probably something I should practice because it would, <laughs> probably would help me. But yeah, I'm always tongue tied. Yeah, well, yeah, I, I, it's, it's funny because I, I haven't felt you being tongue, tongue tied yet. So, well, you're, just you're, give you're me a little time. <laughs> <laughs> so, let, let me say this before I forget. Uh, I love <laughs> your mom and dad as actors. They are terrific. Everything Thanks. they're in, they're so good. They're such good actors. I, I think, um, especially. Uh, character actors underappreciated mm -hmm. because they're they're so professional and yeah. whether they're doing drama comedy whatever it's so good I, they're they're both just terrific yeah and recognizable you know it's mm -hmm. one of those that you see them so many different things you're like hey yeah. there they are <laughs> yeah totally yeah they really are such an inspiration to me and like i said in addition to loving their work you know when i you know i haven't seen everything but i've been able to see a lot um, but also just from that doing great work and being committed to craft that, like I said, just like that they've built a life and they, um, 
gave me such a beautiful, creative, um, positive childhood. And, um, yeah. you know, it's just, especially because it is the career I'm pursuing and I understand how trying it is and how frustrating it can be. The fact that they, you know, powered through all of that and, um, <laughs> together, you know, and they've, right. they've been over, I mean, they've been married a very long time and they've made it work and, and it's just very, um, inspiring on, on every level. Yeah. So um, I'm, I'm always happy to hear that when, you when other people to, like them. Well, yeah, of course. You got to uh, work uh, on a film with your mother where she directed. Am I right? That's yeah. been a few years back. Yeah, she did a short film, uh, part of this uh, short film kind of um, collection. Girls, Girls, Girls was like the overall title. Yeah. And um, yeah, that was actually my senior year of high school. And uh, nice. yeah, really, really awesome cast Octavia Spencer, Lauren Miller Rogan, Anna O'Reilly, wow. uh, Jen Zabrowski, uh, Francis Fisher. Uh, and uh, it was it was a really fun idea. Uh, my mom had just done the artist actually and yeah. was inspired to do a short that had no words, even though it was a, a very different style <laughs> in the sense of it was not, you know, being a, a black and white movie. It's actually a lot more pushing daisy saturated color. <laughs> uh, very nice. But, I like pushing yeah, daisy. Yes. Oh my gosh. One of my yeah. all time favorites. <laughs> Got me through a lot. Um, yes. But yeah, um, uh, that was kind of the inspiration there. And so it's a nice, I, I think it's about 15 minute uh, short. Um, yeah, that, that was a really, uh, really fun experience. Cool. Yeah, that's actually, that's actually really, uh, really great. I would, mm -hmm. uh, I would enjoy that. I need to find that one to watch. Yeah. That's a, what a cast. Yeah, yeah, just just really great, and you know, you kind of get to follow all the different characters and see how they come together. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. So I wanted to ask you about, and I want to make sure I get it. Oh, I should have yeah. done that. Um, Operation Othello. Yes. Mm -hmm. Tell me about that one. Uh, yeah. So this was, um, I guess, twenty eighteen was when we captured it, but it had been an idea that had been percolating for me for a while because I did right after I graduated the fall after I graduated Juilliard I ended up playing Iago in an all-female production for Harlem Shakespeare Festival and um, which was an amazing opportunity and um, we did it very traditionally like the inverse of classic Shakespeare because it was all women playing all the roles right right, right. Um, but you know I was dressed as a swashbuckling Iago man Fun. and uh, had a nice five o'clock shadow and I was growing out my hair at the time from a pixie to probably around the length it is now um and so and I had done like a more of a golden blonde that summer oh, and very nice yeah. were coming in so I kind of slicked it back it had that it just looked I just I just it was like perfect timing to play this <laughs> Uh, and, uh, but part of that, you know, as I was creating a character, uh, a big theme that came up for me was I realized how gendered my perception of honesty was, um, in the sense that as a woman, I thought to be honest, there was a purity. Well, and honestly, I think that in life there should be honesty should be pure, but there's, you know, we see Desdemona as this, you know, beacon of of light and purity and and her honesty um, is is very much a female honesty, whatever that means. And the only reason <laughs> that came up for me was because they call Iago honest Iago throughout the play. And it's, you know, Shakespeare's right. looking at us. And but I was like, but it 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 doesn't land if it's so obvious that Iago isn't trustworthy. You have to find a way to make Iago um you have to believe that Othello trusts him in that's an right. authentic way. Otherwise that's it makes right. everyone look like a fool. And that's, that's, I don't think that's what Shakespeare wanted. And what I found was that there was a bluntness and a shooting from the hip and a swashbuckling Jack Sparrow quality. Again, yeah. as I continued to create the character uh, that of course people called him honest Iago because we often call men that behave that way trustworthy. You're right. In a way, that right. we see, we're we're a little bit more trepidatious if a woman's behaving that way, um, and I was like, oh wow, like I really got to discover that, even though <laughs> you know those things were definitely there. I'd played other male roles, uh, other male Shakespeare roles specifically in in school, and that was part of a uh, Trezana Beverly who directed this Othello. She had directed me in one project, um, and then uh, she would she directed consistently every year at, at Juilliard for a while, and had seen me play. I had just played Macbeth, um, and had done King Lear, 
uh, in my second year. And so she literally called the school and was like, who's that girl who plays all the Shakespeare roles <laughs> or the male Shakespeare roles? <laughs> And, uh, and they were like, you mean Mary Chifo? She was like, yes, yes. I'd like her audition for my play. Uh, so that was kind of how I'd, you know, um, been cast in that role. And um, so again, these themes had been coming up and it had come up with Macbeth. Like I just had had this new perspective in playing these other um, male roles. And then Iago was really the culmination of that. And I do think he is one of the greatest, if not the greatest Shakespeare character. And I, I really think Othello is one of his best plays in just structure and, and character yeah, so building. Good. It's so good. And so it feel, contemporary makes it feel like we're the best over here in the <laughs> contemporary world, which, you know, it's highly debatable. Um, but it just feels like a movie. Like I'd be like, yeah, yeah. the plot twists and the character stuff. Um, but so I really fell in love with the play and fell in love with the character. And like with any Shakespeare character that's juicy, you don't want to stop. You're, you're never satisfied. Yeah. That's and right. so I started wondering what a modern woman would look like as Iago and uh, kind of with what I learned about uh, um, this new perception of honesty and what okay. would happen if a woman behaved the way the male Iago behaved uh, in a contemporary world. And so I had this, this concept kind of percolating in my head and then through what I call serendipity highway, uh, which has guided <laughs> me through most of my, my life. Um, nice. I was able to kind of pitch the idea to Julius Tenen uh, and Kaylin Hunt of Juvie, Pro Juvie Productions, which is Viola Davis and Julius, her husband's oh, right. production company. Yeah. And we ended up in collaboration with Josh uh, Nelson Youssef, who uh, is head of their interactive, um, develop a, a VR interpretation, Operation Othello, an adaptation. And um, we were able to do a proof of concept uh, kind of pilot uh, in VR uh, in 2018, uh, and we've got to go to Cannes and Rain Dance, and uh, we we have since segued away from doing it in VR uh, at the moment. There's just you know it's amazing the XR space is just so expansive um, and changes every day. You know it's just yeah there's new discoveries being made all the time, and so it was an incredible experience, and I'm really grateful. I have a really wonderful relationship with everyone. Um, at UV and um, you know we continue we continue to develop and percolate in that realm but it was a really amazing experience that was kind of happening simultaneously with me being cast and then being a part of Trek so uh, being able to be working on that adaptation whilst uh, starting to be covered in prosthetics and do Laurel and those themes you know there's a lot that was crossing over in Laurel's experience especially in the first season um, as a woman in a in a man's job in a lot of ways. So it was a really neat kind of sym symbiotic uh, relationship between those two characters. And uh, yeah, female Iago is, is uh, a character I have not said goodbye to yet. So there's much more uh, to come. Yeah, so we, we, yeah, we, we may still see a version yes. at some point. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Well, I will pitch that if you need somebody that doesn't have any lines, but just, you know, to get killed on screen, I'm yeah. the guy. Okay, great. I will keep that in mind. <laughs> no, no lines. I might be able to grunt, yeah. but okay. you don't want to mess it up with me speaking. But if you just, it has has to be early. Just no explanation. Just boom. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Noted. There are there there are plenty of plenty of of grunting soldiers ar yeah. around. <laughs> yeah, just a you know, it doesn't even have to be a good swashbuckling death. Just you know, just a death. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Great. 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 Noted for sure. So I had uh, read that you were a little late coming to the uh, the Trek fandom, but once once you got into it, you you got into it. Yeah, you've caught up quite a bit on the lore mm -hmm. and the history of Trek, yes. and of course you would with the uh, with the role. But talk a little bit about yeah. that. Yeah, I had like I said, I did grow up definitely in the loving genre in general. And yeah. I was a little more on the fantasy side, a um, little bit more magic than than science. What's wrong with uh, that? Yeah, <laughs> I was the same way. I was I was no. I was very big in, into Trek and some of them, mm -hmm. but at heart, you know, book wise, more yeah, of a fantasy guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think you know what's fun is there are so many crossovers, obviously, in the yeah. themes. And and what I love about genre in general is that it's just it's always been 
the greatest way for me to process my own life. Like right, I'm right. less inclined to be able to, like, I can see like if a story is similar to my life experience, then I'm like, oh, that's great. That resonates. But the, the moments that I've had the most um, visceral kind of cathartic experiences as have been when I've watched a great science fiction movie or a great fantasy film. And there's just been this emotional moment. And even though it's a metaphor for something else, I'm like, <laughs> um, and then of course, as a child, just the idea of magic or, you know, that, that there's the power that we have as human beings, um, and so much so like why I really got into Alexander technique, I think is because it's so energy based. Like I am definitely yeah. a bit of a woo woo, <laughs> but of a woo woo energy. <laughs> out. Um, and uh, so yes, very much into that. And then I, but I always like when it came to movies coming out and it was always fun. My dad was definitely the person that enjoyed those sorts of films um, as I did. And we would go and see stuff together. And I did go to see um, the reboot of, of, yeah the Chuck films, the 2009, um, which is, you know, I think is a great way to get someone into it because JJ really like played on that nostalgia and the cast oh, yeah. is so, the chemistry of that cast, it just, they're, they're such really great good. Characters. And it made me go, oh my God, these characters are so great. Like I want more. <laughs> and um, my dad, you know, introduced me to the original films and, you yeah. know, some of the original episodes. Uh, and uh, so that was kind of where I fell within the Trek fandom for a while, like through high school and whatnot. Right. Um, I knew I liked it and I knew that, you know, when a new movie came out or whatever, I knew I would enjoy it. Um, and then, yeah, w but once I was cast, uh, that's when I really dove in. And obviously being a Klingon, you know, it's so well fleshed out i was just like look oh yeah like i literally have within arm's length i have like the klingon way over oh, your there you go yeah uh, <laughs> <but> old Marco <laughs> Grimm, and it's like literally falling apart um nerd but yeah exactly <laughs> i mean that's the thing like everything it's exactly what i realized in high school i was like oh i can just be a Amazing. nerd but with my art um and I do I love geeking out about things and that is what I love about the fandom overall is that it's passion and, and excitement oh, the best. Storytelling. and uh but yes so I did I had I was cast in like uh mid-August I think of of 2016 and at the time we were going to start filming in like September or October I think October so I was like oh I don't have much time I gotta do all my research uh, so I ordered like every book I could find, you know, downloaded every like whatever uh, <laughs> thing I could find. And then I decided at first, of course, wanted to watch every Trek episode known to man. And uh, then I went, hmm, that's a lot. And yeah. so it, I it's, a, it's a long history. It's, it's a lot of episodes. Yeah. And uh, but I did get through all of the Klingon centric episodes. So, you know, because there's on the Wikia page, there's literally you know, every single episode where a Klingon pops in. Do you have a favorite Klingon from what you watched? Yes. I mean, my favorite full lady Klingon, uh, uh, not like, this <laughs> sounds so Klingon elitist, but not a half Klingon right, is, right. Uh, is uh, Grilka. The Balana who, out. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think Balana is awesome. Jeez. But uh, I think because Laurel and particularly timeline wise, I was really wanted to see like how the full Klingon ladies, yeah, of course, were, you know, shown to behave. And I just really loved Grilka as like, oh, yeah. I, I think. And, uh, um, th and then the actress who I, I always forget her full name, but uh, is Mary, I think, as well as her first name. But she does such a great job of just like being ferocious and sexy and yeah. like. Yeah, that whole that whole first episode with her is just so funny and great and quark and everything. Yeah. Um, so I really loved and her journey and that was like a key in um, research wise of how still patriarchal the Klingon society was like right. it was very helpful for me in looking at Laurel's relationship with the world she was in and as a commander, you know, sometimes the similarities you know, there. Yeah, between the yeah. Two. yeah. And how it was different from, you know, we talk a lot about or as you know on various panels like with Starfleet it's the ideal world where we're not talking about those issues as much because we have hopefully passed them whereas Klingon society there's still some hurdles to jump over and so <laughs> it was fun and I think we 
I was speaking to that on panels whilst we were even still filming the first season and then of course into the second season. And I felt that the writers um, really, you know, were thinking of that and in conversations, it was clear that that was a theme that we could explore in the Klingon world that was different from what they were exploring with the Starfleet plots. Um, so that was really fun and, and cool. But yeah, Grilka um, and uh, what uh, Cirilla, um oh yeah 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 so, yeah so i like her a lot yeah. yeah and then i like dax is obviously not a klingon but in a character who i just i kira and dax are like just i just yeah. love them i i did really fall in love with deep space nine that was the one that i yeah, a lot of people about. say deep space nine is the best of the star treks and i i, I get mean, that i get that yeah. it's a little more character driven Thing. yeah i think yeah the nature of being on a, a station as opposed yeah. to a ship, you know you still get plenty of adventure and and all that stuff and yeah i mean i think that you know like every show has its own strengths and has different you know things that draw us in and i've appreciated all of them but i do think yeah the kind of serialized storytelling that they were starting to do on there um that obviously i think really kind of um influenced discovery um you know, and, you know, at the time it was, we weren't doing as much serialized storytelling. So I think that it's cool that they, they did lean in that direction more. Um, yeah, it, was, it was more um, episode to episode before yeah. they came along and, and they really, they had the themes that ran through, not just a season, but the whole show. Yeah, totally. Yeah. <laughs> and that really is what happened. I was trying to just watch Klingon centric episodes and there are so many, because especially once Dwarf comes on and uh, but then I was like, any episode that I missed, there was like inform information I missed. So I was like, no, I just have to watch all the episodes now. So like, yeah, I guess around season four or five, I was like, no, nah, I'm just watching the rest of the show. So uh, I've since gone back and watched most of the uh, first few seasons, uh, the non-Klingon episodes, just so I oh, have. That's good. Play. That's good. That's good. But so yeah. I've got a good um, Terry Farrell story. Oh, yeah. I, 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 love I think it's good. It's probably terrible. But yeah. I think it's good. So in the early 90s, when I was in college, I owned um, comic book stores. That was that was my way of putting myself through school, which That's is still cool. the best job I ever had. Yeah, Love yeah. Love it. Cannot raise a family that way, but just as a, a single mm -hmm. college guy, pretty good. Pretty yeah, good. yeah. But we got it in our head, and this was, you know, it was before the internet, but we got it in our head. We were, uh, we were going to have a convention and we were going to get somebody from Star Trek to come to the convention. And this was really before that was a thing. You yeah, know, back yeah. then, it was just the comic book people that went to conventions. There was no, you know, uh, celebrities that came. But we were, we were determined we were going to do this. So, yeah. So, so, yeah. So, I don't even know how we did it. But somehow, and it took us a while, we got a hold of the agent for William Shatner. So... <laughs> We were like, you know, we would yeah. like to have Mr. Shatner to come yeah. to this little town in West Virginia for this convention. And the guy was very nice. He's like, yeah, we can do that. It's whatever the amount was, you know, which was probably worth more than the store was worth. So we we're like, oh, no, we can't really do that. I mean, that's that's too much. And he's yeah. like, why? I represent other Star Trek people. And he he named somebody else. Yeah. And we're like, no, nah, that's, that's still yeah. a little out of our range. And he just kept going down the list. And he got down eight or 10 people and he's like, well, I have this brand new person that's getting ready to be on a, a spinoff mm. named Terry Farrell. Wow. He, he was, she was like, she, he, she yeah. can do it for this amount. I was like, we can do that. We'll do that. And she was so nice. She came yeah. out. She had lunch with us. She hung out with us. We had our little convention worth every penny. Oh, yeah. So I love nice. that. Yeah, she's been so lovely. She and Nana both, because I did very much fangirl over both of them. I, I, my uh, Dortmund, uh, Germany, there was a convention and they were both there. And I think that was the first time I met them. And I was like, hi, 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 I really love you guys. Can we get a selfie? And it's like, the selfie is so perfect because it's like me in the middle being like, and they're like, um, but um, she's just so lovely and kind. And, you know, throughout this wild time of us not being able to be in person together as much uh we've still been able to you know message each other every once in a while and and uh i've just always really appreciated her kindness i totally agree that she just has it's a, really a community you know, once you're in a star trek show everybody seems like they kind of get along and are willing to help each other out it's really nice yeah 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 that's yeah, really nice if i had to pick a klingon for me 
I would probably go Christopher Plummer. Ah, uh, yes. He was, yeah. he was so over the top is the best. He, he, yeah, he, he was excellent. I do really like Martok as well. Speaking oh, of Martok like, was great. Gowron, love Gowron. Yeah. yeah. Gowron and became such a meme. You know, he's out yeah, there. Yeah. All these little, yeah. But, but yeah, Martok yeah. was terrific. Too. Yeah, they're both. And th those uh, two actors are so lovely and great as yeah. well. And I've been able to not in person interact with them, but on Star Trek Online, our characters, you know, what's so fun about oh, Star Trek cool. Online is, is all the characters from different timelines can interact. And so uh, in the l recent last year's Klingon kind of saga, uh, are all of our characters kind of intertwined, which is very fun. Does the online game, is it continuing Laurel's story from the show, does it kind of go from there onward or is it like a story from somewhere in her past? It's, it is, it's a continuation in a certain way. They try and they're like, they leave a lot of space for plot. Like they didn't want to write anything that would override what could possibly right. happen since, you know, they've jumped so far in the future. Like we don't know yeah. what Laurel's continued journey as chancellor was, but it is set in a time much further in the future. And, um, so they didn't, they, they left the details of my rule vague um, so that if, you know, someone was, was inspired to, <laughs> to continue Laurel's story in, <laughs> in a live action way, uh, they wouldn't have impeded upon it. But it was as, as um, they find me, I mean, it's, it's actually quite, quite a fun epic Klingon plot. Like it, when I was reading the the lines and script, I was like, this is just so great because I'm in Grethor, which is, you know, the Klingon equivalent right. of hell because Vogue's soul hadn't made it to Stovacor. And like, I made a sacrifice, you know, it was very in line with Lorel's <laughs> general dealings with Vogue slash Tyler. And, um, and then they have to get me out in order to help with their current issues with, you very know, nice. uh, tyrannical, um, uh, Klingon leader and uh, and so yeah I had it was basically two big episodes you know game episodes um, where Laurel kind of really came back and helped with Tanovic my son uh, and um, yep. then uh, and then since then uh, I have become the mission giver which is very fun um, well it's neat yeah so I get to every few months go in and give the next mission for the game which uh, Al Rivera, who um, is that head there, is just such a such a kind, thoughtful person. As is their whole team. I mean, they really are. What I love about Star Trek Online and other of these licensed um, kind of components of Trek yeah. is that you often get these like super fans who know the whole plot and and have <laughs> you know really concentrate in there and are making all these allusions to various timelines and things like that and and so I really felt so excited to be able to give voice to Laurel like it felt so her and the way they wrote her dialogue and everything was just so in line with uh, how I feel she would speak. So I really had a great time. On the, on the show, you had some epic speeches. <laughs> yes. They were awesome. Yeah. I really, um, yeah, that, that, yeah. In, in both seasons, I mean, I got to kind of go out with the big Klingon speech and then I, yeah. I was, I was grateful that the mother speech got to be primarily in English. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just cause, you know, I mean, it's, it's such an incredible task to take on the Klingon, uh, but I think we all found that, you know, when there were, you know, justifiable reasons for us to speak English, it was just, you know, it's one less thing that you're dealing with because That's you right. are dealing with prosthetics and and heavy costumes and yeah. flames and all your lips falling off and all that yeah. stuff. So, how, long, how long did it take you in the in the chair, in the makeup chair, getting ready for each episode? Um, averaged about two and a half to three hours, uh, depending on the day. Um, yeah, that's we kind of, well, you said you were getting up at like 2 a.m. to warm up. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Like a lot, if you know, if I was the first shot and it was a Monday or a Tuesday, the pickup time would be about 3.42 a.m. Oh, and, uh, and, uh, and then of course the prosthetic team has to get there before that. And, uh, and, uh, yeah, but you, yeah, you kind of just get ready. Uh, either, you know, some days I was like, I needed to, I would just be reviewing my lines in my head. Sometimes it was, you know, less dialogue. So we could kind of play music and be chill or whatever. And, or, you know, try and meditate, not fully sleep. Cause you gotta be, you can't be like slumped over while they're putting stuff on you. Um, but yeah. And, and there was, you know, when I had that kind of ba basically half body prosthetic 
for my sexy scene. Um, that was about four, four and a half hours of application. Oh, really? Yeah, just because it was just a lot more to get on. And, that, and yeah, right, uh, right, right. Um, yeah, you never think about that, but yeah, I guess. That yeah, would yeah, be yeah, yeah. And then there were a few times with like my my first dress in the first season, I had to have more of my chest exposed. So we had, you know, right. it wasn't as much. Um, but yeah, and then of course costume takes, depending also, but you get strapped in or whatever, that's about 15 to 30 minutes getting into that and eyes, you know, contacts and all that sort of stuff. So I would say the process usually overall would be three hours, three and a half hours before you're actually on set. Well, how long does it take to get out of it? Much less time. (laughs) Thank goodness, because they don't use, uh, they don't reuse the prosthetic. Um, Okay, okay. Because because of the glue and everything, it just would add a, a layer that is you don't need and it's 3d printing technology so they they just have um them printed Replicate. new every day you know they know okay mary's working this many days that's very star trek of them to yeah. Just replicate. Yeah. yeah literally <laughs> replicating um tastes delicious too no uh, <laughs> and uh yeah so they um uh you know pre-painted a lot and then would kind of do an airbrush kind of sprinkle of extra yeah. uh stuff and um and yeah but then they kind of just at the end of the day also you've been sweating so much uh half of the prosthetic is already coming up yeah um yeah. but they kind of just cut down the back and uh they like to call it hot dog juice or you know there's just a lot of sweat that comes out um but uh, <laughs> but it's fun and then what's great is you know take it off and you still there's like with the face there are you know still some stuff glued so they do have yeah. to very you know delicately take it off but they have you know the appropriate materials to do that do you have um, any trouble with the do you i mean are you um do you have sensitive skin does that did any of it bother you you know i do have sensitive skin but i think it kind of prepped me like i just struggled with various cystic acne and stuff like so i said yeah. i had such a skin routine right that just you know taking it off at the end of the day i i knew what i needed to do and i didn't have more issues than i was used to having i would say and i didn't have like some people do you know get rashes or like have a really bad reaction and i did not have that um which i was very lucky because you know regardless of my passion for the role if i you know couldn't do it um for those right i could if you physically couldn't do it yeah yeah but luckily that was never um Never really an issue. Other I wonder than, if, if the if, if guys, especially with facial hair, if that gives yes. them trouble because of the yes. you know the hairs getting involved and maybe yeah, I mean mostly I um they have to shave basically yeah. the facial like um they put me in like a you know like a bald cap for my hair, um and then Doug Jones just for time efficiency yeah. when they are filming he'll just shave his head too because it's just like one less thing to worry about, um. And I had debated about doing like at least a pixie cut or something. And and James McKinnon, who was the head at the time for Discovery, he's now the head at Picard, but um, super, super awesome. Um, he and then Hugo Villasenor and Rocky Faulkner were the three um, from the American team that came and, and they were just, they're just excellent. And the whole Toronto team is great, but you know, the hours that the prosthetic team has to spend reapplying or making sure everything looks yeah. okay throughout the day. I have to be in it, but they have to make sure it looks good <laughs> and not falling off. And that's true. Um, that's not an easy job either. Yeah. But James did say that, you know, hair or no hair, it's more of just like, what's easier for you. And he was like, everyone sweats. Everyone sweats in the prosthetic. <laughs> Nobody doesn't. Like Doug is ideal because he doesn't sweat as much and his body is built to, you know, be creatures oh, yeah, yeah uh, and, of course. Know, um but <laughs> still it, he still sweats no know, need to be embarrassed we all yeah, sweat <laughs> yeah so i definitely felt all my like sporty tomboyness came out you know it, it served me oh, well because i yeah, like getting yeah. dirty and gritty and feeling like i've worked hard like you know you can't <laughs> finish a day in prosthetics and not feel like you did something <laughs> like yeah, you've accomplished you know, something yeah, yeah. Take a nice hot shower Good. line that be like, I made it. I did something. Yeah. Did they make you speak Klingon during the audition process? 
No, I, I really benefited from my, my, my training. I really yeah. feel the combination of them knowing um, my work from Juilliard and then my actual showcase from Juilliard, CBS casting had seen that. Not that I was <laughs> speaking Klingon in that, but um, I had already a, an established relationship with their casting. And then oh, um, okay. Okay. I think that, and at the time, Laurel was, you know, they were, they knew it was going to be Klingon heavy in the first season. And they knew that they wanted to have someone to model kind of this new design off of for the women. And um, they were like, well, if we create this battle commander character, Brian Fuller specifically, um, you know, you know, and, and Gwendolyn Christie had just been, you know, um, seen as Captain Phasma in Star right. Wars and like this sort of, you know, what, why don't we just put this woman in what is typically a male's position? And um, so that was a huge, you know, I'm six feet tall, angular features. There's a lot of me that's very like, cling on. <laughs> and, um, and then from that, you know, I felt my audition was kind of perpetual for that first season was right. it became indicated that plot wise, you know, someone needed to have the idea for Vogue and all these sorts of things. And Aaron and Gretchen, once they were showrunners, really, they they ran with that um, idea. And I am so grateful. I feel that they were huge um, advocates for me uh, when it came to my story and um, really, um, you know, we're like, let's see how much we can do with Laurel. And after that big first episode of Laurel's in the, in the fourth episode, um, you know, I had you know, been around saying a few things here and there, but that was the first time we really got to see me. And it was from that episode um, onwards that then I was kind of told the general premise that we ended up seeing on screen of her and Vogue and getting captured and all of that. Um, so I'm just very grateful that I felt it was really me getting to audition through application. And so I did. So technically, yes, I did have to speak Klingon in my audition because my audition was like the Went first four episodes of the show. Yeah. Um, but uh, I am very grateful that, you know, it is rewarding when you work really hard and people recognize it and continue to, to write for you uh, and say, great, you're creating this character and we respect that. And uh, um, we, we want to find out where she is. And like I said earlier, we were promoting the show while still filming. And I felt in my building of the relationship with the writers, um, there was a real beautiful kind of um, symbiotic kind of exchange there of who I was and who Laurel was. And um, yeah, I'll, I'll never forget the, 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 the journey of that kind of first year and the first season into, you know, from it being filmed to promoting it to it airing and, you know, just the, you know, the continued relationship I've built with the fandom through social media and conventions, both as Mary, the geek, and Laurel, the cool <laughs> chancellor. Did you celebrate when she got promoted? Yes. Like if, I, if I was on a show, I'd be like, I'd, I'd be popping some champagne. Hey, my character just yeah. got promoted. <laughs> it was. It was such a thrill because I didn't really know until right before that last episode. Obviously, it was clear at a certain point that someone needed to rise. And she had said early on, you know, um, she didn't want the mantle of leadership you know, and so the telltale sign. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> talk, you know, like that classic sort of thing. So, you know, it's there and like, who, you know, they got to resolve the war and I'm the only Klingon that still looks like a Klingon, you know, like, <laughs> so it Bro. was hope, you know, but still like, it was a really exciting moment when I do remember it was Aaron and Gretchen on the phone with those of us who were going to be in that final episode. They kind of gave us the general sense of where it was headed and they're like and then Laurel will like take the detonator and she will become the leader and it was like ah! um so that was pretty awesome and getting to do that final speech was really neat and uh and then yeah and then her continued reign into the second season was was very cool and I do appreciate so much I was talking with my mom about this you know and she's played various recurring roles and guest star roles and in, in shows and she just reflected, she's like, Mary, it's such an incredible arc for a recurring role. Really like, it, you know, was so incorporated um, and got to have so much of her own story told within a plot. I mean, there's so many incredible characters on that show 
it's it's just to have that level of of um story is is incredible and i think from starting as the commander who had like one line in the very first episode in the pilot to getting to come in on that cleave ship at the end of the second season and literally the ship that was such a sign of destruction and chaos and klingon <laughs> evilness you know that she ended up really being that that champion of good and an allyship that that the federation needed i i just it's really humbling and beautiful that, you know, I think too, because it, I really felt it came from my passion for the role and their passion for the character. Yeah. But, you know, I, I more and more, you know, and I'll reflect back, like sometimes I'll, like before I do a Star Trek online thing, I'll listen to the mother speech again, or just, you know, take time to look over some clips if I'm putting a real thing together or something. And I go, oh gosh, that was a lot. Like <laughs> Lorel got to do a lot of cool things. And I, I'm just so humbled and grateful for that. I think I think I would be listening to that speech like every time I worked out or eating. It'd yeah. <laughs> be my pump up yeah. uh, all the time. You may call me mother. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so it's that's that's so good. What's the reaction been? I mean, it's such a strong female character. Have you gotten reaction from, you know, from women, from, from girls? You know, what has that been like? It's been awesome. I mean, I think it, definitely, I mean, it, Laurel being such a strong character and being such a nuanced and flawed character, yeah, whatever you want right. to call it, that, you know, she lives in the gray and that, those are the characters I love the most. I mean, um, I talk often on various <laughs> things about my love of Kylo Ren and my the as in like wanting to be a Kylo Ren type character <laughs> yeah. uh, that, that is both good and bad or perhaps thinks that they're more bad than they actually are because society tells us we can only be good or bad as opposed to be human right. and obviously the rel is not a human uh, but you know someone who um, not only, you know, I think she believed so strongly in what Takuma had told her, but then through her own intelligence and empathy came to realize that what she thought was true wasn't, yeah. wasn't as true or right. And, you know, I love her relationship with Cornwell. I mean, I think that's such an awesome, um, you know, connection yeah. and yeah. really influences her. And then obviously her continued understanding of um, Tyler is his own entity. I mean, she really has to come to terms with um, what she thought was true and what is actually true. And so I think that's something that really resonated with a lot of people. And I do, you know, get at conventions and online, a lot of women talking about how much, particularly, and they emphasize even more in the second season of a woman in a, in a man's world and the things they come up against um, and, you know, these badass women who are actually in these like incredible, you know, careers in science or whatever saying like, you inspired me. And I'm like, okay, well you inspire awesome. me because you're out there fighting the fight. Yeah. And, you know, you know, obviously the entertainment industry is, um, <laughs> wrought with, them with a lot of misogyny. <laughs> and so I, I, not to say I'm not fighting those battles as well. Um, <laughs> But I, I, I think it's, it's, it's very neat to see how women um, really across the board in different careers do resonate with Laurel's struggle um, and, you know, success in our couple, as we would say, <laughs> and, and, um, in, in coming into her own power and coming from the shadows and, you know, it, list, uh, or ignoring what society is telling her that she only can work from this angle and say, no, you can be in the spotlight. It is harder right. sometimes and sometimes more dangerous, but it is, it it's is possible. often the place you need to be. Yeah. I, I, I love that uh, so much. You mentioned, I know we got to wrap up, but you mentioned Kylo Ren. Don't <laughs> you think you would fit in the Star Wars universe? I would love to fit in the Star Wars universe. <laughs> <laughs> There's so I, many uh, shows out there now. Yeah. I, yes, it would be a thrill. I, like I said, I do love genre and I do love, and I think like, you know, Star Wars is kind of this perfect meeting for what I love. Cause I, it is science yeah. fiction fantasy. And, uh, uh, the idea of the force definitely is very much my own sense of magic. And, um, yeah, I, I, I would love to play any character there. And I love, you know, I do love playing non-humans in these science fiction worlds. Um, I'd be down for maybe not quite as thick prosthetic. <laughs> <laughs> um and also if they want me to be a human that's great too um but uh yes you could probably I, do I, that 
He's super down. I'm putting it, I'm putting it out there. I'm Great. Out. We'll use what the force to make it happen. What was your fantasy series growing up? Do you have a book series or something that was kind of your your thing? Yes, I would. It, it was the Chronicles of Narnia and Harry Potter. Oh. Those were my two biggest ones. Oh, yeah. Um, and then you know, kind of because I like those, people be like, oh, you should check out these other shorter series. I also like the Spiderwick Chronicles. That was like a little bit oh, of a that's an underrated uh, one, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was one of the first ones I remember with Eve. Actually, uh, we would read it back and forth to each other, and you know, we were you know, kind of nice. I can read a book out loud, kind of thing. Uh, so that was, but those, those in a lot of the uh, imaginary stories we created were uh, two young British sisters who discovered they had powers. Like that's nice. most Very of the nice. plots of our stories. I, I will also put out there that you would fit on the Wheel of Time. Oh yes. I have not checked that out yet, but aesthetically I've seen the posters and I'm like, yeah. I'm, I'm, I like that world. That was, that was my favorite book series. Right. I was a big Game of Thrones fan, you know, oh, cool. Fall yeah. Ice and Fire, but Will of Time, that was the one I, I really loved. And they're oh, doing cool. a pretty, they're doing a good job, you know, with, oh, uh, with the series. And it's very, you know, women centric. You could fit on that. Great. I will that that will you I just will tell me who to call. Time. I'll take care of it. Oh, great. I love it. <laughs> All right. What one, one, one more quick one? Um, have you got to to play so, uh, like a soccer player on screen yet? I have not yet, and I would love to. I actually just uh, rewatched yeah. on Monday with my girlfriend Bennett, like Beckham. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, which was definitely a film. I'm so glad that I, you know, talk about, you know, my shirt says representation matters. Oh, very um, nice. Yeah. And I, you know, that was, you know, a great, you know, soccer sports film. What when I was in the thick of loving yeah. soccer. Um, so yeah, a film like that or a TV show. Uh, getting to play a soccer player or a soccer coach would be so fun. I if you do were a soccer yeah. coach that accidentally falls into solving crime. I like it. Yeah. I There's like it. There. Yeah. I like it. We put that in the universe too. <laughs> but Mary, thank you so much for taking uh, time today. This I was looking forward to this one, you know, since we set it up and it's just yeah. been great. Thank you so much. I've re yeah. I've enjoyed this so much. You're so lovely. I love your energy and positivity and passion. And well, thank you for saying that. that. So that, that's so nice. Uh -huh. Thank you. And tell people. Yes, I will. <laughs> I will. I definitely so, will. So before I let you go, is there anything that you're currently working on that we can kind of keep an eye out for? Um, <laughs> it's funny. Y yes, but I can't talk about any of it yet. <laughs> oh, that means you have to come back. <laughs> yes, indeed. Yeah, it's it's funny. I'm right at that precipice where I can't quite yeah. say, yeah. but there there are some fun stuff uh, that I'm I'm very eager to talk about uh, very soon. So I'll definitely yeah, yeah, I'll yeah. follow up with you for sure. Yeah, please do, please do. So uh, where oh, can I will we find? Say, actually, yeah, I did just realize there is one thing I can talk about that I'm actually okay. very thrilled about, but we don't the because of unfortunately because of the surging numbers in LA. Uh, we have yet to make our executive decision of if it's happening at the end of January or January or maybe mid February, but we are going through the be, um, bespoke plays is a, a writer centric uh, theater company I'm a part of, yeah. and we did a bunch of readings on Zoom every Sunday during the pandemic, and it was amazing and just an awesome group. And uh, uh, we've been uh, they they do workshop readings of new plays. And yeah. the next play that we're doing a reading of is actually my girlfriend who I alluded to, Maddie Goff. It's called Lady Face. It's a sci-fi play. And um, it's it takes place nice. in the backstage of a theater in the year uh, 2171. And that's all I'll say. Um, but Exciting. it's a very fun kind of mixture of if you love sci-fi, if you love theater, uh, it's, yeah. it's a really fun I'm combo. In. And so it will be um, at some point read aloud in LA, um, hopefully end of January or mid February, and then will be also be available to stream through the website. So if you're following me on social media, I'll be posting about it, but it's also- That was my next question is where can we find you on social media? Cause I assumed you yes. would let us know on there. Yes, uh, Mary the Chief, I on Twitter and Instagram, play on <laughs> my last name, uh, just one F, uh, but yes, M-A-R-Y-T-H-I-E-C-H-I-E-F. And then bespoke plays. I'll be posting about them, but they are their own handle, bespoke plays. Um, I believe on both uh, Twitter and Instagram as well. And uh, I've been working with them. I did a reading with them in 2019, 
And then I did another reading in New York, actually, this past October. Ellie Pyle and Christine Boylan are the co-founders. And it's just a really awesome, all-encompassing group of people. Uh, TV writers, film writers, theater writers, um, a Venn diagram of magic. And uh, yeah, so the, 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 that's in addition to the other fun um, things I'm up to. They're kind of like my my heart and my core. And yeah. uh, I'm really that's excited awesome. to play in particular. So keep an eye out. Uh, yeah. It will happen in LA at some point when everyone's comfortable sitting in a room with masks. <laughs> yeah, 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 I know. Yeah. Yeah, hopefully that's at some point. Soon, very soon, yeah. Let's yeah, but cross our fingers. Went, went appropriately soon. <laughs> that's right, appropriately soon. Okay, so right. last thing, this is, this is a, a, just a favor to me. Can you say you are watching Too Opinionated as Laurel? Great, yes. Okay. Um, <clears throat> you, okay. You are watching Too Opinionated. Wait, was there more that I had to say, or was that it? That was perfect. Okay, I, uh, good. <laughs> no, it just, I was processing. I was like, holy crap, Laurel is talking <laughs> on my show. <laughs> I love it. Great. Thank you so much, Mary. Thank you. All right, uh, hold on one second. All right, so that was the terrific Mary Chifo. Hope you guys enjoyed that. She was uh, absolutely terrific and very tolerant of us running the uh, a, a little bit long as usual that's completely on uh on me so thank you guys so much if you haven't done so yet really appreciate it if you would uh, help us out with our youtube channel meistercon pod please subscribe we would really appreciate that we've got 320 or 30 episodes now audio and video on our website meistercon.com it'll let you know if we are um doing anything in studio, if we're going on location, if we're covering conventions, whatever we're doing, it'll be on there, meistercon.com. So definitely check that out. Thank you guys so much. If you liked this interview with Mary, we have half a dozen or so other Star Trek theme interviews, and you can find that on our Star Trek playlist. So check that out if you're a Star Trek fan. I guarantee those other interviews you will want to see. So definitely check those out. Until next time, bye everybody.